waiting for it to connect. Okay, good evening, everyone, and thank you all for joining us. My name is Alyssa Karpinka, and I'm the event coordinator for McNally Robinson Booksellers in Saskatoon. This event is coming to you from Treaty 6 territory, the traditional lands of the Cree, Soto, Dene, Dakota, Lakota, Nakota, and Métis Nations. Just to note that this event is being live streamed to our YouTube page, so please be aware of the webcam to your right. I'd also like to take this moment to encourage you to silence your phones for the duration of the event. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the Saskatoon launch of The Book of Rain by Thomas Wharton and published by Random House of Canada. Thank you to Thomas for being here tonight and for working with us to create this event. Thomas Wharton's novels, stories, and nonfiction have been published in many countries, including Canada, the US, the UK, France, Italy, and Japan. His first novel, Icefields, won the Banff Mountain Book Festival Grand Prize, the Writers Guild of Alberta First Book Award, and a Regional Commonwealth Writers Prize for the Best First Book. He currently lives and teaches English in Edmonton. I'll now turn things over to Thomas. Please give him a warm welcome. Everybody, thanks for coming out tonight. Uh, yeah, I, I live just outside of Edmonton on the east side, so it wasn't quite as far to come here as it might usually have been before I moved out there. Um, yeah, this is a fantastic bookstore. Uh, I haven't been to this one before. I, I, I really I passed through Saskatoon in the past, but this is the first time I've actually been here for a couple of days. And I mean, it's a beautiful city, and uh, I just uh, kind of I want to come back. So, uh, and this bookstore is, is you really, you really, you guys have a, a wonderful, um, you know, you should cherish it. You know, it's, it's a terrific place. Um, I want to tell you a couple of stories about things that happened to me on my way here, or well, one happened to me on the way here and the other one happened uh, earlier today. One of them's kind of ridiculous and the other one, not so much. Um, so I was on my way here. I was driving from Edmonton early in the morning and uh, I got a coffee in North Battleford and I was driving along and uh, then I realized I have to go pee. <laughs> and uh, uh, so I checked Google Maps to see if there was a public restroom. Um, uh, and it, something popped up. It said uh, public shack washroom. No, public sure. shack washroom. <laughs> so I was like, oh, I, I gotta I gotta see what that is. I, I have to know what that is. Uh so I pulled off and it was at a little town, Rodell or Rudell, I don't know quite how to say it, but um sure enough, there's this old outhouse, broken down old outhouse with a sign beside it that says public shitter. <laughs> Okay, so I used it, and uh, and then I went back to my car. I was parked on the side of the road right by the, the outhouse. I went back to my car, and I was looking at my, at my phone, and uh, bang, bang, bang on my door. Somebody knocks on my window, and there's a truck that had, I hadn't noticed had just pulled up, and a guy was knocking on my window, so I opened the door, and I said, yeah, and he said, this is private property. <laughs> so I said, uh, uh, the sign said public. He goes, yeah, we just bought this. We're tearing that down. <laughs> we just bought this land. We're tearing that down. So it's like, oh, I guess I'm the last person to ever use this other one, which is a weird kind of distinction. Anyways, uh, and the other, the other wonderful, more wonderful thing that happened was today I went to the Ramai Gallery, and they have an exhibition there of the, uh, the photography of uh, an amazing artist, Meryl McMaster is his name her name I, I, if you haven't seen this my lord you gotta you gotta go and have a look at this this photography she she's a young Siksika uh, artist and she mostly uh, photographs herself in natural locations wearing really really interesting costumes and she's got a lot of birds in a lot of her photography and and I don't know maybe maybe that maybe that was part of it because there's a lot of birds in this in this book of mine and so I just, yeah, I was just kind of blown away by her art and, and it really spoke to me, which sounds like a cliche. Somebody once said something about how, um, you know, if you, if you experience a piece of art and the top of your head feels like it's coming off, then you know that's great art. And that was kind of the, the feeling I had when I saw her work. So 
highly recommend if you haven't going and seen an exhibition. Okay, so yeah, I thought I would read uh, a couple of scenes from the book and then leave some time for some questions if people have some questions. Uh, yeah, so the Book of Rain, it's uh, it's kind of got several stories that weave their way through it. One of them is about a family um, who uh, they're they're from Vancouver and they're on their way across the country as the dad has got himself a job uh, uh, in Eastern Canada. But on the way, they stop in this little Alberta town, Northern Alberta town called River Meadows. And River Meadows is kind of based on uh, where I grew up, which is, which is Grand Prairie, Alberta, uh, an oil and gas resource town, and also kind of based on Fort McMurray. And originally, and I was going to uh, just sort of set the book in a real place like Fort McMurray, but then I thought, I've never lived there. It's not really my story to tell. So in a case like that, you know, okay, I'll just make up my own town, right? <laughs> my own, my own uh, mining um, enterprise. So in this town of River Meadows, they're mining this fictional ore, which is called ghost. And uh, the stuff, this ghost stuff is kind of like bitumen, um, but it has these weird properties that kind of warp time and space and strange phenomena happen when this stuff is refined that kind of ripple out into the, into the community. And uh, so the Hewitt family is on their way, as I said, across the country, and they stop in River Meadows one night and they go to a diner. And one of these weird ripples happens and they're, they're called decoherences. And the daughter of the family, she's uh, 11, I think at the time, uh, Amory, she drops unconscious. So they have to take her to the hospital and they can't wake her up. Um, and so what the, the father, Ben, does is while they're waiting in this town, he just goes out and gets himself a job at the mine site, mining this ghost ore because he you know, can't sit there forever uh, doing nothing. So they end up staying in the town and he works at the mine site. And uh, the two main characters of the, of the novel are uh, the two children of the family, Alex and Amory. Um, but I'm going to read a part of the book which talks about Ben, the father, his work at this mine site. If I can find it. Here we are. Ben operates one of the mammoth trucks that haul the raw ore out of the excavation pits. They are removing the boreal forest in neat rectangular chunks like date squares from a pan, peeling away a soggy carpet of muskeg to scoop out what has been steeping here for a hundred million years, the sour black honey of time. There's a coker plant on the site, which Ben thinks is funny. This whole place is a coker plant. One of the guys Ben gets to know had been a crack addict who cleaned himself up after his friends staged an intervention. They broke all of his crack pipes and beat the shit out of him. When he tells Ben the story, he adds, and when I got out of the hospital, I thanked them for it. And we're still friends. Those guys saved my life. Only two women work at the excavation sites. Every guy on the shift knows exactly where these women are at all times. Most of this attention is your typical slack jawed scoping of the ladies. But in a few cases, the surveillance is clearly hostile. Some men do not want women in their domain. Everything about the operation is orderly, methodical, streamlined. If you don't count some of the yahoos working the machines. The marathon shifts they pull have some of the younger crew on a slow smolder all the time, as if the toxic fuel that they're clawing out of the earth has leached into their veins and started combusting. Ben stays well away from those guys. He is here for his family. That's what this is all about. It's up to him to be orderly, methodical, streamlined too. But once in a long while, while his new friends, oh, sorry, once in a while, his new friends talk him into a drink after work and it's hard to say no. Some of the younger guys, the loose cannons, go with them. And at the bar, they're soon primed and ready to go apeshit 
on anyone who looks at them sideways. Ben is in the truck cab one afternoon, climbing out of the pit with a load of ore when the hammering starts. At first, he thinks it's coming from somewhere on the other side of the shatterproof windows, but it's his heart banging to get out. He manages to break just before something huge pins him to the seat so that he can't move or breathe. A dark planet has rolled over the earth and is crushing the air and the light out of him, out of everything. He's pretty much gone except for one thought, the kids. He sees them as they were when they were little and after a while notices his hand moving the way it did when he stroked their hair after one of them had woken up from a bad dream. That's what gets him through. When it passes, whatever it was, he can finally answer the voice freaking out on the radio. He makes up a story about the instrument panel going wacky, warning lights blinking like a Christmas tree. They garage the truck and run it through every test in the book. They don't find a thing, of course. Wrong piece of equipment hooked up to the monitor. It wasn't one of those decoherences. He knows that much for certain. It hadn't felt like one of those at all. And anyhow, the wobbles never happened at the excavation sites. Whatever it was, wherever it came from, he wonders, and why had it sucker punched him now? Things are good. His job is paying the bills and then some, a lot of, and then some. Beth has the part-time position at the town office. There's no question about what they're working their butts off for or for who. He's a father. There really isn't anything better a man can be, is there? He doesn't say anything to Beth. He's hoping this was some freak one-time thing, a momentary glitch. But the next three days when he shows up for work, the fear does too, with bells on. His knees turn to jelly before he sets a foot on the ladder to the cab. An hour in, he's sure this is death perching on his shoulder. The next morning, he drives to the site and parks, but instead of heading, heading straight in as usual, he takes a stroll around the perimeter, perimeter of the lot. His hands are shaking, his walk all jerky and wrong like a marionette's. At the far end, nearest the exit, a skinny guy leaning against a sky blue Camaro sees him coming and waves as if he's been waiting for him. Ben has ne never met the guy, but he knows who he is by reputation. Some of the crew call this end of the parking lot the candy store. Easier than ordering a pizza. Hey, the guy says, I think I just saw a bear. A bear? The guy nods toward the trees at the edge of the gravel. They stand there all leafy and uninterested, like this is any other morning. In there, man, I mean, a big bear. Maybe a grizzly, I don't know, it was right there. What's it doing, do you think? Ben asks, squinting and shielding his eyes with his hand. He's really straining to see that bear. He needs to see it. Taking a shit, probably, the guy says. That's what they do in the woods, right? Ben laughs, but it comes out sounding like he's jogging downhill. The guy's eyes widen. Whoa, that kind of day, huh? Yeah, that kind. Are you Jared Sawchuck? None other. Okay, Ben says. Okay, indeed, Jared Sawchuck says. What'll it be? Ben looks at the Camaro, then at the trees. He raises a hand. You know what? Forget it. I'm good. Well, I would say not. Ben heads for the gate. In the staging compound, he finds Dylan Chaudière, the shift foreman, and tells him he must have come down with a stomach flu or something. Dylan looks at his chalky, sweating face and backs away, ordering him the fuck home. So I think I'll, uh, I'll stop that section there. Uh, so um, Ben works at the, at the ore site and the family lives in, in River Meadows, but then there's a uh, an accident at the refining site and a uh, kind of catastrophe that forces the evacuation of the town. And, um, you know, in some ways, I think I was thinking of Fort McMurray and the, and the great big fire that they called the beast when I was writing this, um, you know, because it almost seemed like that entire town was going to be consumed by that fire. 
it's incredible that it wasn't and that nobody died. Um, anyhow, in my fictional town, everybody is forced to flee, and uh, but they're never allowed to come back because this or with its weird uh, properties causes the, the, the whole area to become a kind of forbidden zone, a no man's zone, and it's, uh, it's cordoned off and nobody's allowed to go back in there. Um, but so the family leaves, but years later, Amory, the daughter comes back. Uh, she loves animals. She spends most of her time outside and uh, she, she just wants to, she wants to help the animals who get trapped in this place. There are the places where you can get trapped by these, these kind of weird phenomena that happen. And so she goes in there and, and rescues animals from, from this um, place. But then one day she goes in and she doesn't come back. So uh, Alex has to come back to River Meadows. He lives, he lives far away from there, comes back and he searches for her. And that's one of the other parts of the novel. Um, so what I'm going to read now is a section where Alex, uh, this happens actually the very day of the, of the, ax, the mine site accident, but earlier in the day before it happens. Or the catastrophe happens. And uh, Alex is, well, originally he was, I was going to make him a writer. Uh, but then I thought, you know, there's so many writers in novels, you know, <laughs> writers write about writers, right? And I just thought, oh, I, I don't want to do that. That's just tiresome. So, so I made him a game designer um, because when I was a kid, I used to make and design, create my own board games and that kind of thing. And uh, so that was a that was a possible life that didn't happen, um, but I've always thought about it, right? And and so I decided that would be Alex because this is a this is a book of possible lives. I've decided that would be Alex's life. So he's a game designer, but when he's a kid, he's sort of he's into comic books and and games and all that stuff. <clears throat> and and Amory, as I said, she's always going outside and uh, just she's all she wants to do is commune with animals. <clears throat> Alex is in his room that afternoon working on his new Kid Quantum comic book when Amory appears in the doorway. He's surprised. She's been gone for hours, wherever it is she goes these days. Usually she returns from one of her forays without anyone noticing. You just suddenly find her there, in her room or wherever, as if she'd never left. Amory stands there, not saying anything. What is it? There's something I need you to come see. Come see what? Just, I'll show you. It's in the woods. Of course it's in the woods. I need your help, please. 30 minutes later, they've reached the bank of the creek. They can hear river meadows behind them and the soft, distant murmur of a working town. This is in late May, but it's been a dry spring and the water in the creek bed is little more than a trickle. They cross on the little three log bridge that somebody built there maybe a long time ago. On the far side, they walk through a stand of poplars and come out into a long, straight open area like a cut line, only narrower than the ones Alec saw when Ben tried to get him interested in snowshoeing one winter. This odd corridor through the bush is full of knee-high grass, most of it still pale and withered from winter, and clinging plants that clutch at clothes and scratch bare limbs. There are rusted metal posts with numbers on them spaced a long way apart that must have something to do with the extraction industry. Alex thinks. He's come out here a couple of times with his friends to explore and goof around. They've found shotgun shells, cigarette butts, beer bottles, but never stayed long. There's something creepy about this place. It smells faintly of burnt rubber or melted electrical wiring. Where are we going? He asks his sister for at least the fourth time. She hasn't told him anything. They walk for another few minutes until they near a huge pine that has fallen into the path. Its branches are still thick with needles, but they're brown. Amory comes to a stop. Alex looks around. You brought me out here to look at a dead tree. No, she whispers, pointing at the pine. There, look there. He squints. Half concealed in the tangle of shadows beneath the branches, there's an animal. Alex is so startled, he nearly jumps back. It's a small dog, he thinks at first. And then he notices the patchy, dark rust shade of the fur, the pointed, black-tipped ears and sharp snout, 
and he realizes this must be a fox. It's tensed, heeled forward as if it had frozen in place while darting into a run. The wind is catching and flicking stray tufts of its fur. Pale amber gems of its eyes are fixed straight ahead. A feeling like a frenzy of ants crawls across the back of Alex's neck. You never see wild animals just stand there like this when people are around. As soon as they catch sight of a human, they're gone. Something is very wrong here. It's stuck, Amory says. Her tone is matter of fact, simply stating how things are. She doesn't sound scared or upset or anything. Alex feels a cold dread in his stomach, the fear either of the animal or his sister, he's not sure. What do you mean, stuck? It's trapped. I don't see any trap. He can't see it, but it's there. He doesn't know what she's talking about. He searches the ground and finds a dead branch as long as his arm, slender enough that he can grip it easily, but with a good solid heft to it. Holding the stick at the ready, he dares another step toward the fox, then another. Amory follows. No, it's a stuffed animal or something, Alex whispers. It's not alive. This is some kind of trick. Did you do this? It's alive, Amory says. Look at its face. Alex edges closer. He can just make out a tremor along the fox's muzzle. After a further moment of careful observation, he sees the same almost imperceptible trembling of its forelegs, the ribs pressing against taut skin, the quick rise and fall of breath. It looks like it's starving, Alex says. It must have been stuck here a long time. It's in pain, Amory says. It's really hurting. How do you know that? Its eyes. It's scared of us, he says. That's all. It can't move for some reason, and it's scared shitless. No, it's dying, Amory says, because it can't escape. We have to help it. Alex turns to her. That thing will bite us for sure if we go anywhere near it. It probably has rabies, and I don't want to get stuck like that. You won't, Amory says. How do you know? I got stuck here, too. You what? The last time I came here, I went up to the tree and I felt something holding my arms and legs, something I couldn't see. I pulled really hard and I got away. I don't think the trap is strong enough to catch animals as big as us. We're not animals. Yes, we are. I'm not touching that thing, he says. We have to do something. Alex glances down at the stick in his hand. There's one thing, he says. Amory looks at the stick and back up at her brother. Don't do it, she says. And for the first time in a long time, he can hear emotion in her voice, see it in her eyes. Not fear or disbelief. Something more like disappointment in him. Okay, so uh, the book ends in kind of an unusual way. Uh, when I was working on it, uh, I, I just became more and more interested in animals and, and um, the fate of animals in a human dominated world. And, you know, the more you look into it, as sad as it is to say, the fate of animals is most in a human dominated world is mostly to die, to suffer and die. Uh, and, you know, so it's, it's, it's one of those things when you start writing a book, you don't know where it's going to take you. And sometimes it, it takes you in a way that takes you somewhere that kind of changes your life. And in the end, I, I thought, I want to give animals a voice in this book, too, not just human beings, but animals, other animals as well. And um, because I love birds, it was, I figured, well, it's, it's mostly going to be birds. Um, so the novel ends with uh, uh, far in the future after human society has collapsed and is, there, there are very few humans left on the earth. Um, and uh, there's, a, there's this group of birds that live in this place called Water's Edge. And uh, what you learn in the book is that birds developed a, uh, a language to so speak to one another, in, an interspecies language, so that they could all communicate with one another. And the reason they developed it was because of us. They developed this language to survive human beings and what they were doing to the planet. So they have this language of their own that they call the uttering. And I didn't invent the language, um, you know, but it's, it's, I imagined it as being a language that would be composed of, of sounds 
and wing flaps and tail flutters and all kinds of other movements. Um, and I realized, well, if a human being tried to talk in that language, it would look ridiculous. It would, you know, look something like this. <laughs> and uh, uh, but you know, um, I thought, okay, so they have their language. How am I going to convey that on the page? And I, and I realized, well, all I can do is um, have a. In the far future, there's a researcher who um, is learning this language, and uh, a human researcher, I mean, who's learning this language um, because. In this, in this future time, human beings have wised up to the fact that we need to get to know other the other lives, the other creatures that live on this planet if we're going to have any kind of a, of a future. So the, the, the bird, there's a bird that tells a story to this, trans, this researcher, and then the researcher translates it into English. And so that's what you get at the end of the, of the novel is this long epic poem or story that's uh, told by a bird to a human being. And um, it, it, you know, it's not just gratuitous, it kind of ties up some of the threads and helps you understand what happens in the other parts of the novel. Um, and I was really worried about this because when I was, when I was doing this, I thought this, you know, to end a novel with a, with a great big epic poem kind of seems like a crazy idea, uh, but, you know, the, one of the publishers who uh, had a look at it, one of the editors at, uh, at a publishing house, Random House Canada, uh, her name is Ann Collins. And, and uh, when she got back to me, she said, I just love that you ended this novel with this epic poem, like what a crazy thing to do, but it works. So it was you know, one of those moments when you feel justified in, in taking a really strange risk in your writing. Um, so I'm just gonna read a little bit of this poem at the end. Uh, it's kind of a story of the hero, like a lot of ancient epic poems are, and the hero is a magpie, and his name in the uttering, the bird language, is too long to pronounce, so the translator just ends up calling him Yap, because his name, his name means talks too much kind of thing, right? And uh, so in the, in the bird poem, he's called Yap, that's his name. In that time, the rains did not fall. The earth burned. Many animals perished. Many humans died. After a time, there was only water's edge, the last green place, the last good place. There was water there. There were seeds and berries and tiny crawling alives. That's the translator trying to translate a word in bird language that means living things, he calls them the lives. Birds could live there. They could find mates for a season or a lifetime. They could hatch their eggs and care for their young. It was safe there from the humans and what they had done. In that place, in that time, our foremothers said, Yap, the magpie, came into the world. Yap, who went to the borders of death and beyond to the sky's teeth. Even nestled in the egg, Yap was a talker. When his parents sang to him the first teachings that all parents give before their young come forth from the shell, even then Yap did what no chick had done. He sang back to his parents from inside the egg. Yap's grandmother was the one who told him about the humans. Yap snapped up her stories like ripe berries. He could not get enough of them. He asked his grandmother, where are the humans now? Are there any left? His grandmother told him no animal in Water's Edge had seen a human for many years. Yap dreamed of meeting humans. With the days, he grew and spread his young wings to the air. Smallest of his siblings, he flew first from the nest. He flew farther and farther each day until he could reach the boundaries of Water's Edge. There he met the terns, who of all birds journey the farthest across the heaven sea. Yap asked the terns, had they seen any humans in their travels? They hadn't, they told Yap. The humans left things, signs you could read that told you they were there. The terns hadn't seen human signs for a long time. Not their many smokes, 
not their dead earth paths, not their streams filled with black poison. If there are any humans left, the turn said to Yap, forget about them, let them die. One sun going in the last of the grasshopper song, which in human terms is August, the crows spread the alarm through the trees. The call passed among the birds. Humans had been seen not far away. From all over water's edge, the birds came. They flew, they flocked, all the chosen speakers from the tribes and nations. They came to the gathering place below the tall lone pine on the earth mound at the shore of the marsh. I, I slipped a name of a Canadian publisher in there. I don't know if you noticed Lone Pine. <laughs> on the earth mound at the shore of the marsh. Bald eagle settled on the top branch of the tall lone pine. Horned owl alighted nearby. Raven perched on a bare black limb. All of the speakers came to the heart of water's edge, to the tall lone pine, to the earth mound by the water. Hawk, falcon, nightjar, ptarmigan, pintail, killdeer, yellowlegs, ibis, grebe, Phalarope, swan, blackbird, woodpecker, blue jay, gray jay, vireo, redpole, swallow, pivot, nutcracker, wren, warbler, dipper, and all of the sparrows. I'm indebted to Chris Aker, or John Acorn's um, Birds of Alberta for a lot of the bird stuff here. Um, okay. Yap and his family were foraging in the bunchberry meadow in the ring of old birches when the alarm came. Humans, humans are coming. It was Yap's turn to keep watch from the treetops for danger while his parents and siblings searched and scraped below. Yap didn't like keeping a watch. He wanted to play games with his siblings. He hated sitting alone in the windy top of a leafless birch keeping watch. When the call came, Yap heard it. He flew to his family. Humans, he told them, humans have been seen. They're coming this way. That's not our business, said Yap's father. Your uncle thinks it over twice, speaks for our clan. He's going to the gathering. You go back to watching. Yap flew back up to the birch top. The wind shook him. It ruffled his feathers. It stirred his mind. He couldn't stop thinking about the humans. He had to see them. One of his sisters flew near. Yap called to her. You keep watch. I'm going. And Yap flew off to the gathering place. He came there to the gathering of the speakers. He was small and he nestled in the tall grass at the edge of the mound. No one noticed him. Let's read a little bit more of this. At moonrise, the rufous hummingbird stands in the air, found the humans. She led them to the heart of the water's edge where the speakers were waiting. Yap was still hiding in the tall grass. He saw the humans coming. They were impossible to miss but hard to see. They had no wings. They walked like no other animal. There were two of them, an old one. His grandmother told him humans called this a woman and a young one, what they called a boy. The woman's hair was pale like moonlight through mist. The boy was small, but he was not afraid. He walked in front of the woman to protect her. Beside him walked their like wolf. When it wandered away from the humans and they called it back, it came to them. The humans climbed up the earth mound. All the birds waited. No one spoke. I think I'll stop there, actually. So, uh, yeah. Um, one of the characters, the, the old woman is actually a character in the earlier part of the book. And, uh, so she manages to travel to the far future and meet Yap, and then they go on this quest together. And uh, the quest is, the purpose of the quest is to find a way to keep humans from going extinct. So, uh, you know, in some ways it's, it's kind of like my, my um, way of talking or thinking about uh, how, you know, we have so much to learn from other living things on this planet. And uh, that's probably the only way that we're gonna survive as a species if, is if we, start paying attention to what other creatures, animals, plants have evolved to know, you know, they're, they're kind of uh, animate intelligence. Some people call it that, right? AI, 
instead of artificial intelligence, it's an, it's an animate intel intelligence. And, you know, it's evolved over millions and millions of years. So, it, you know, it's got to be pretty good software, you would think, <laughs> after all this time. So, yeah, so I'm kind of, kind of finding a way to talk about that, but in a, in a fictional or even fantastical sort of way. So, uh, yeah, uh, I guess that's all I'll read. Um, does anybody have any questions, comments? Yeah, I'll be to try to answer them. I'll ask you first and then Jeanette. Okay. Uh, go first. What was the uh, inspiration for the ghost? Uh, yeah, the question is what's the inspiration for the ghost or? Um, yeah, like I was saying, you know, I, I, I originally thought I'd be writing about Fort McMurray and bitumen, you know, the oil sands, but I really felt like I've never lived there. I don't know much about that. You know, I've, I've known people who've worked there and they, they've told me some incredible stories and I've, I've put some of those stories into the novel, but, but I thought, no, and this is something I do, right? When I, when I'm approaching a subject and I feel that I don't have enough knowledge or closeness to it, but I want to put it into something I'm writing, I'll just invent something that's kind of adjacent to, it's fictional, but it's adjacent to whatever the, the real thing is. And so it kind of allows me to, you know, this, this, this mysterious or kind of allows me to talk about bitumen and resource extraction in, in, a, in a metaphorical kind of way, right? You know, like bitumen doesn't have these properties of, of warping time and space and causing weird phenomena, but in a way, it metaphorically, it, it kind of does, right? It kind of makes people go crazy for money, right? And so, so there's something I'm, you know, I'm kind of, you know, echoing off that that idea with the ghost or, yeah. and why I call, yeah, why I called it ghost? I don't know. I had lists and lists of things I could call it, every every word under the sun, and that was the only one. That, that was the one that kind of stuck. That, you know, sometimes you just kind of go with something that feels right without quite knowing why. Jeanette? Yeah, I really, really enjoyed your reading. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it occurred to me when you're reading that earlier passages, you, you, uh, unless you already knew a lot, fair bit about mining, you must have had to do quite a bit of research. And research and fiction writing is something I think about a, a lot. Um, and I'm interested in whether you, I don't know if it's an either or thing, do you amass a sort of substantial bedrock of research factoid things at the front end? Or do you kind of like as needed where you're in a part of the story and, oh shoot, I better find out more about such something or other. Mm -hmm. And then you have to go down the rabbit hole and then you come back or, mm -hmm. How does that the research process work? It, it's kind of both, actually. You know, right. when, when I know I'm going to be writing about a particular subject, I'll read everything under the sun that I can get my hands on. I like that you call it bedrock, right? Because yeah, it fits it fits with this topic. But um, uh, yeah, you know, it's just part of the, the process is partly just absorbing all this stuff, and and then you know you kind of what you're hoping for is that to use another metaphor that's kind of bitumen based, that you're gonna distill a few things that you can use out of that, right? Pages and pages and pages of research notes, sticky notes and all the rest of it, index cards. And it may just end up being a, a, a few details, right? That just kind of, you can't let go of them. They, they stick in the mind, right? And, and you realize I can make use of that somehow. Um, but then, yeah, at the, on the other hand, there are moments where it's like, uh, well, you know, Ben, Ben drives one of these giant trucks that that hauls the ore up out of the uh, mining pit, and uh, so it's like, well, I guess I'd better find out how those things work. And you know, um, and short of going to Fort McMurray and asking if I can, you know, climb up into the cab of one of these things, I, you know, I had to go and, and search out. And it's kind of difficult in some ways to find that information, you know. And I, I don't know whether that's because. Uh, they don't really want people nosing around in, in what they do or what, but but I had to do some digging for sure. And, and then of course, you know, because I'm my story takes place in a kind of adjacent reality. It's like, well, I don't know exactly what the, the uh, control panel looks like on one of these things. So I'll just, you know, make it up. 
it, it must look something like a jet engine control panel or something, right? So yeah, yeah, so it's kind of both. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Tom, for that very engaging reading. And I mm -hmm. love the subtle use of humor in those passages you read. Mm -hmm. So my question would be how, what's the story behind the title? Like, were there other titles you had in mind before you finally settled on this one? Mm -hmm. Or how did you come about this title for the book? Yeah, um, you know, it, it's kind of lost in the mists of time now, but, but you know, sometimes you you... I was trying out all kinds of different titles and then somehow this one popped up and it's one of those moments where you're like, oh yeah, I don't know quite why, but that's the title. And what ends up, how it ends up being used is um, this, this epic poem that, I, that uh, the bird tells to this human translator, the, the title of this epic poem is The Book of Rain. And you have to wait to the practice, yeah. just about the last page of the novel to find out why it's called The Book of Rain. Um, but I, I had the title already, and it was just a matter of kind of like, it's, it's going to come into this book somewhere, somehow. And, uh, it, but it wasn't until clearly, or just about the very end of the novel that, okay, yeah. And now I know why it's called The Book of Rain. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 Thank you very much. Sure. Yeah. Um, thank you for coming, Saskatoon. Oh, thank um, you. You mentioned how it was kind of like risk taking in terms of writing the epic poem, the last part. Like at any point when you were in that part of of the novel, did you think like, oh, this is just too out there, and I should try something different? Or, and and if you did, like, what made you stick with it? Yeah, it definitely. You know, I I I I just thought. I've never done anything like this. I don't write poetry. What am I doing writing an epic poem, right? But as I said, I, I, I wanted to give animals a voice. And how was I going to do that, right? How was I going to give them a, a way of speaking in the novel without being kind of, you know, corny or something, right? Uh, kind of sort of first person. There's, there's a lot of books out these days I've noticed that are like first person novels in the voice of a dog, right? Um, which is anything new, actually. I think Mark Twain wrote a, a short novel in the voice of the dog, and he also wrote a short novel in the voice of a horse, a uh, cavalry horse. Anyways, um, but yeah, sticking with it, yeah, it just, it, it, it's just a matter of, I've got to see this to the end and see if I can do this, right? It's one of those challenges where it's like, oh, you know, I don't know, I don't know about this, but but I'm fired up to see if I can accomplish this challenge. And so, as I said, you know, it was kind of a, a sitting there, sending the book out and, and wondering if editors will see what I'm trying to do and if it actually works, right? Does it actually work? Um, and uh, I think there were one or two editors who passed on the book. One of them said they passed on it because they, they didn't feel like it was located anywhere, which I don't know. I mean, it's set in Northern Alberta, Maybe it says a bit more about the Toronto editor than it says about the book. It's not located anywhere. Anywhere you know, maybe. Um, but uh, yeah, and this this editor, you know, kind of made me feel like uh, she validated uh, what I had done. So yeah, you know, sometimes you just have these intuitions or this feeling like you gotta you gotta stick with something, um, no matter what. And you know, there was also my agent too who. She saw an early draft of this, which had a lot more other, you know, stories and nods and ends in it. And, and she sent me a page of a few pages of notes that were like, what is this? I don't understand this. What <laughs> this was going on? So um, a lot of that got pared away, but I hung on to the bird poem. And uh, I don't recall whether she, I think she was kind of diffident about it. Like, I don't know. Um, but I was just like, I'm keeping this, right? And I'd get rid of that other stuff. Keeping this. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks very much, everybody. Uh, it's been a pleasure, and I'm really I'm grateful that you came out to hear me read. And I hope I can come back someday and maybe be a part of Word on the Street. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Uh, Got a uh, homemade Book of Rain bookmark. I was going to bring a bunch of them to give them away, but I forgot to bring them. I make these. Does anybody want 
homemade book of rain bookmark is going once, going twice. All right. Okay. All right. I'll just say a quick word before I let you go. I'd like to thank Thomas again for being with us tonight. Uh, we have copies of the book of rain on the desk to your right. And if you'd like your copy signed or if you'd like to say hello, I'm sure Thomas will be happy to meet you at the signing table here. Uh, thank you all for coming and enjoy the rest of your evening. <laughs>